Uh, if you'd like to be, if you'd like to be seated, please. Okay, uh, grab a seat, everybody, or if there aren't any seats, grab a floor and uh, make yourself feel comfortable. I didn't know this room could take so many people. Uh, we've got over 300 people registered, and um, including uh, 50 members of the media who are here. The attention on this is huge, and it's partly because it's the Earth Institute, partly because it's New York, uh, partly because it's Columbia University, but mainly because of the issue being discussed at this meeting, which is all about how on earth we're going to deal with the, the complicated issues of managed retreat from areas as they come under threat from climate change. Uh, my name is Alex Halliday. I'm the director of the Earth Institute. Uh, I want to welcome you here to this amazing meeting, which is called At What Point Managed Retreat Resilience Building in the Coastal Zone. Uh, it's the flagship event for a three-year process uh, that the Earth Institute has had in place to look at the whole issue of climate adaptation. Uh, and they've been working, the, the Earth Institute's been working on what do we need to do and what will be the most useful things going forward. And this was one of the main things that came, came out of that. One of the uh, great things about this um, amazing university and amazing uh, Earth Institute is that we have some, it's all about people. We have some amazing people and the, I, it's a very, very exciting place to organize and get involved with. Uh, I've had a brilliant time since I've been here. Uh, so I'd particularly like to point out and give some thanks to Alex de Sherbinen from the Center. Where's Alex? He's over there. Uh, at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, or CSIN. And Radley Horton, who's going to be speaking in a few minutes uh, from the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And they're the main people who are co-chairing this meeting. Uh, but also the amazing Haley Martinez. Where's Haley? Oh, Haley's at the back there. She's done most of the, and her team have done most of the organization. So big round of applause. Thank you very much. So the, the issues of sustainability do require an interdisciplinary approach. They require people to think outside the box in terms of their own fields and actually look at what information there is from other fields. Uh, and you can see this in the whole area of climate adaptation, uh, as we've seen with the demonstrations in, in, France, in Paris, for example, and places like that. How are we actually going to change things in our countries and cities in a way that actually citizens will find acceptable. This is a massive problem for us on, on many, many fronts. Uh, we have some of the most uh, exciting conversations around this issue taking place over the next two days. And it's been brilliant to bring together not just scientists, but government officials, planners, uh, community groups, journalists, and others here to Colombia. And I'd like you to feel one of the things we're doing with the Earth Institute in particular is making trying to make people recognize that this is, a, this, is a, uh, this is something that's really not just for uh, a group of faculty and researchers. The Earth Institute exists for the world, and we're here to help. And we want to, you to feel, if you want to work with us on anything, that uh, we are here to provide advice, support, maybe do some things together and, and uh, provide a lot of um, help in terms of helping communities, including New York City, in that respect. Uh, I was particularly impressed by the amount of, uh, when I moved here, the amount of public engagement that goes on, uh, which is really important, but also the amount of practice work. So most academic institutions focus on research and maybe teaching, and you've got to be pretty good at research. You've got to be okay at teaching to get tenure um, uh, if you're at a good university. Um, but actually, one thing that's really important about the Earth Institute is we focus on practice and getting out there and working with communities around the world and helping to provide solutions to their own particular issues around sustainability. The Earth Institute has over 20 research centers. Uh, of course, the biggest is the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is up the river uh, uh, on Palisades, which has got several hundred people. Uh, but overall, we've got uh, somewhere around 750 scientists. And as I've been here over the past year, I've realized that Actually, when you connect all the other people in architecture and engineering and public health across the university, we're going to end up with an Earth Institute with about 1,000 people within a year's time. So it's a fantastically powerful multidisciplinary organization for you to engage with, the biggest of its kind in the world. And I think it's the most effective because we've been working on interdisciplinary collaboration for the last 20 years since it first formed. And we uh, look at a whole load of aspects of, of um, the issues of sustainability, 
uh, including public health, ecosystems, energy, natural hazards, um, poverty, uh, and the issues of urbanization more generally. So um, one of the things that I think we need to think about is that actually some of the, which may come out of this meeting, I don't know, I'd like to get any feedback from you. One of the things we're thinking about right now is we've got all these great subjects at Columbia. What subjects don't exist yet? What subjects do we need to address the issue of climate change in the future? There have certainly been amazing people working on the issue of environmental law who changed the law of this land uh, with their fundamental studies in law. And do we have those kinds of people? We've got people who are practicing law professors, but actually, do we have people who are actually rewriting the laws of this land? And similarly, the whole issue of climate ethics, the issue of poverty and how that relates to climate change. The issue of other things like um, infectious diseases and climate, the issues of climate communication and climate policy. Uh, these are fields, and climate and the arts as well. I mean, lots of people are now thinking about this. Alex Poots has just been involved. You know, Alex Poots, the director of the, the Shed, uh, which is the new, uh, big new grand thing down the road, um, which has got over 300 million to spend on fantastic new art productions. He wants to work on climate change and the environment and see how we can embed some of the thinking about climate change and the environment in art productions and me multimedia productions. So what are the disciplines and what are the ways in which we need to develop uh, climate-related activity that's going to be really new in the future. And we'd be very interested to hear about that from you if you think there are particular things where actually we don't, we don't actually have the, the knowledge yet, the, the thought leaders, to actually take the field forward. At this meeting, we're going to explore some of the big issues around managed retreat. Um, under what conditions is it necessary? What governance structures are needed? Who pays? Retreat to where? And how can science help us make more informed decisions about this? So I very much look forward to the conversations over the next uh, couple of days. Uh, it's not going to be just about climate science, but it's going to be engaging pl planners, practitioners, journalists, etc., and civil society. And we're looking forward to those conversations. And please feel free to uh, talk to us openly and about things you don't understand or you, you think we should understand. Um, I just want to finish by uh, just saying something about why this is so important. And that is that um, 50 million years ago, I'm a geologist, 50 million years ago, which is just a mere 1% in the history of the Earth, a tiny fraction of the history of the Earth, 50 million years ago, there were no ice sheets. We didn't have an Antarctic ice sheet or anything like that. Uh, sea level was much, much, much higher. Uh, if you took all the ice off the ice caps uh, off the North Pole and South Pole today, sea level would rise by about 64 meters. So over that period of time, since 50 million years, we've been building up, we've been cooling the planet, and we've actually, for a variety of reasons, which we don't have time to go into, and we've been actually seeing glaciation, and eventually we've had the north, uh, northern hemisphere glaciation starting three million years ago. And if you look back to when CO2 levels were where they are today, uh, you realize that actually sea level was a lot higher. And there's a plenty to... There's, there are people who are talking about climate panic, and maybe that's the right word, uh, but you certainly should be climate concerned uh, because um, right now sea level is rising at about three or four millimeters per year. Doesn't sound very much, but a century ago, actually just a few decades ago, it was raising, rising at about half a millimeter per year. And people are worried about when it starts to go up by 10 times that amount per year. And that's looking increasingly likely. It's looking like what we understood about the ice sheets may not be correct, and they may be less stable than we thought. So we've got every reason to be concerned, and this is really, really important going forward, and it's going to affect so many aspects of what happens in our coastal cities in particular. So that's why we're here, and that's why it's really important that we take this seriously. So thank you again for coming along. And sorry, I didn't mean to put a dampener on the beginning of the meeting, but it's <laughs> clearly have. Um, thank you again for coming along, and I uh, hope you're going to enjoy the conversation and the, and the conference. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce somebody else who's actually incredibly important in, uh, in sorry, make it sound like I'm important, but somebody who is incredibly important, unlike me, uh, uh, who is um, Janie Bavishi, who's director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency, and so she'll be coming up and saying a few words before Radley Horton comes off to comes in to sort of lead us into the meeting. Uh, Janie leads the city's One New York City Resiliency, One NYC Resiliency Program, preparing the city for the impacts of climate change and other 21st century threats. 
Previously, she served as the Associate Director for Climate Preparedness at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and before that, as the Director of External Affairs and Senior Policy Advisor to the Administrator at the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration. So, uh, without any further ado, we're thrill thrilled to have her here, and I'm gonna ask her to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Alex. Good evening to everyone. Um, it's great to see so many adaptation and resilience thinkers and practitioners gathered here. And to those who traveled from afar, a warm, albeit muggy, welcome to New York City. Uh, here in New York, Hurricane Sandy was, of course, a pivotal moment. Uh, the devastation was unprecedented. 44 New Yorkers lost their lives. We experienced $19 billion in losses uh, and damages. Uh, and, and close to 90,000 buildings were inundated. New York City is working to address not only another Sandy-like event, but also the chronic impacts of climate change. Like many other cities around the world, we contend with uh, a future that will include longer and more dangerous heat waves, more extreme rain events, and significant sea level rise, which is projected to be up to six feet by 2100. And that's on top of the one foot of sea level rise that we've already experienced since 1900. We're investing $20 billion in a multi-layered resiliency strategy to upgrade buildings, including city facilities and public housing, and to improve our zoning codes and our building codes to account for climate risks. We're also hardening infrastructure and critical services, such as energy, transportation, telecommunications, to minimize disruptions during an extreme weather event. We're making our neighborhoods safer through emer improved emergency preparedness plans and stronger connections with community organizations. And we're adapting our 520 miles of coastline. And by the way, that is more than Boston, Miami, Los Angeles, and San Francisco combined. We're using the best available science as the foundation for all of our planning, bearing in mind that climate change is a dynamic threat. As additional changes in the climate begin to materialize or sea level rise accelerates, different options might become more practical or perhaps even absolutely imperative. And we're at the beginning of a long-term conversation that our generation is starting, but we know well, future generations must continue. As we prepare for our coastal communities for the risks that climate change presents, there are a few principles that we have learned that I want to share with you today. First, there is no one-size-fits-all uh, or silver bullet. Each community is unique, and solutions must be tailored to particular communities. Community engagement is absolutely critical to reimagining the waterfront. Every, engagement requires us to be thoughtful and innovative about how we communicate uncertainty and how we communicate the science and the risks. And lastly, we must honor people's pains and legacies of environmental and social injustice as we plan for the future. No single office or city or country can solve these challenges alone. Addressing them requires us as resilience professionals to share insights and lessons from both successes and failures. As we say in my office, we must leverage collective genius. It's something that we borrowed from Google. That's why I want to thank Columbia University and the Earth Institute for bringing this conference together and for all of you for being here. And I also just want to point out that uh, there are several members of my team in the mayor's office and several representatives of city agencies that will be here throughout the three days of the conference. Um, so I hope that you will interact with them, um, learn about what we're doing in New York, but they're also here to listen and learn from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Janie. Um, I'm Radley Horton, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to give you a preview of what we're going to do um, over the next three days. I'll try to be brief so that we can get to our panel discussion uh, with the four experts whose names you see here. I'll be honest and say that we struggled a little bit um, as we came up with a title uh, for this conference, at what point managed retreat. So let's unpack some of those words a little bit. At what point? This suggests um, a moment in time but also a moment and place, and maybe hints at the idea of a binary, overly simplistic yes or no around time and space. Then there's the word retreat. Well, retreat also sounds binary. It sounds like abandonment. It sounds defeatist in some ways. Even the word managed is challenging, right? 
who's doing the managing. Uh, this doesn't really capture the full range of experiments that are that are really underway around the around the country. Individual autonomous um, retreat, but also more organized uh, activities. So there are limits to language, and I think that's something that we're going to get into um, in this panel as we think about um, paths forward. But no matter what we call this topic, I think the turnout as we look around the room uh, today and over the next couple days uh, hints at the timeliness of this topic. I believe that we're here seeing the first large convening of an emerging community of researchers and practitioners, even though the topic itself is actually not new. We can find um, the early IPCC reports referencing retreat. The last national climate assessment and some regional assessments in the US have gone into a little more depth um, about retreat. And indeed, retreat is already happening. In some instances, it's the kind of incremental or unplanned retreat. But we're also going to hear some examples today of indigenous communities that have been endeavoring to retreat for decades. And as we look to the future, uh, I think it's going to become clear that we've just scratched the surface of the conversations that we need to have. So this suggests um, a discussion that will go far beyond should place X be abandoned and when. Rather, what we're seeing here, I think, is dedicated, a dedicated community looking at history, looking at trends in climate and other things, and thinking long term in an iterative uh, and proactive way. They're thinking about retreat as part of a spectrum, along with things like protection in place, the classic seawall, or um, accommodation of water, things like elevating of buildings. Um, but over time, more and more places are going to be thinking about this gradual transition from viability to non-viability of in situ adaptation, with key tipping points possibly having more to do with the role of institutions, communication, social networks, risk perception, and popular culture than any precision around climate projections of exactly how much sea level might rise, you know, as, as one example. But as a climate scientist, I do, want, I do hope you'll indulge me in a little bit of climate science, because climate science is telling us that retreat is going to be necessary in certain places and contexts. You're going to hear about how sea level rise and coastal flooding are going to threaten hundreds of millions of people uh, around the world this century trillions of dollars in assets. You're also going to hear about what heavier rain events are meaning for floodplains around the world that already have vulnerabilities. You're going to hear about combinations of high heat and humidity that more and more are going to mean that those with pre-existing health conditions are unable to perform outdoor labor uh, agriculture the way they have in the past. We're going to hear about places that may gradually shift from occasional droughts to a state that's more similar to long-term uh, drought. So this clearly has implications uh, for the ability of the land to give us livelihood. Also need to think about the potential for more conflict in some places, which has a climate component. But in all these conversations about retreat, an overall theme is that climate is just one part um, of this story. Uh, but rapid climate change, I think, is one reason that more people and institutions are starting to think about managed retreat, tipping points, and cascading impacts. So as we consider these topics, it's important to remember that precise climate projections, things like climate downscaling, have fundamental limitations that may not narrow that much in terms of their uncertainties in the next couple of decades, no matter how much money we put into um, those research efforts. So I think we need additional broader interactions with society and scenario-based approaches where we talk about possible futures at the intersection between climate and people that are going to help us as we, as we envision some of, these, some of these futures. Which I think frankly gets us to where the center of mass is as I look around the room. It's around vulnerability, uh, it's around impacts, and it's about, around solutions. It's less around climate science. It's around social sciences, the arts, communication, environmental justice, community efforts, decision making, risk perception, vulnerability mapping, legal dimensions, financial markets, infrastructure, insurance, and real estate, to give just a few examples of what you're going to hear about over the next few days. We'll also learn how some of these institutions currently can serve as barriers, suggesting, as Alex mentioned, the need for new laws, as one example, and new visions. We're also going to learn some quotidian details about the nuts and bolts of post-disaster buyout programs to date. 
We're going to think about processes for transformation over time. How do we grapple with the extent of these questions? How do we think about evaluation of retreat strategies that are underway? What are the metrics for success and who defines those? All these tricky topics are things we're going to get into in the coming days and beyond. And we need all these perspectives in part because you can't discuss managed retreat without talking about a lot of other things, other resilient strategies such as adaptation in place, but also more generally the rights, needs, and wants of different people as they envision their future throughout this century. Quickly to circle back to why vulnerability and resilience are so essential to any conversation about managed retreat. The same storm, the same storm surge can mean very different impacts um, in different communities given the amount of how much capital, economic cushion certain people have, pre-existing health conditions for a few examples. And as we think about adaptive capacity in different communities, we need to think about things like how classic macroeconomics can fail us. We can imagine situations, not hypothetically, where the valuable homes um, from a cost-benefit perspective might seem to be worthy of that expensive seawall, whereas from that same sort of purely macroeconomic perspective, it might, fear, it might appear that less valuable homes don't justify in some sense that seawall, just pure macroeconomics. Clearly, something's wrong with that perspective, um, and we need to move beyond it. And that suggests just one of many examples how equity, fairness, and environmental justice are central to the topics of managed retreat, as we're going to hear much more about tonight and over the next few days. I feel confident that over the coming days, we're going to hear a range of perspectives from a range of places. We have over 150 presentations and panelists. We have a live performance from a group of actors. Um, we're going to watch a film. We're going to hear national and international perspectives, as we heard from academics, uh, government folks, NGOs, um, uh, private sector, a variety of perspectives. We're going to have shared learning opportunities, and it's daunting but exciting to think of the interdisciplinary nature and requirements as we think about these challenges. But anything we can do to advance the dialogue and action now may incrementally help reduce the risk of stranded investments um, and also loss of life. This is not just an economic issue. Climate change makes evacuation that much harder. We're only going to be able to scratch the surface of all the discussions that we need to have around these topics, but we've tried to take a few steps to make those discussions and that, and that synthesis as, as productive as possible in the limited time we have. To meet these objectives of advancing a research agenda around managed to treat that's beginning to develop, but also an implementation, a, pr a practitioner's um, agenda. Um, and to support that integrated perspective and get everyone's perspective, we've developed three framing questions that we'll be sending around soon in a survey so that people can look at those over the course of the next couple days. And we have one final hour together on Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. We're going to try to bring it all together, um, what we've heard from the surveys, what we hear um, from our report backs around three, these three basic questions. Um, what is a major take-home message or idea that you got from the conference? Uh, question two, as you return home, what are the next steps for you in terms of actions if you're involved in local responses or collaborations in that sort of research or policy implementation space um, that are informed by what you've heard about in this conference um, or br broader dialogues around managed retreat? And then I think really critically, a third question, what would you have liked to hear more about at this conference? Um, was a perspective or a voice missing or underrepresented? And I thought just to get us started before I turn things over, I'd give a few examples of what appears to be underrepresented um, in this conference. In terms of concepts, relatively few papers about rural retreat issues, relatively few papers about ecosystem services and ecosystem-based adaptation, a few exceptions, but, but not a lot. Virtually nothing about retreat or vulnerability of any species other than humans. Um, relatively little about multi-jurisdictional approaches to retreat. So a lot of uh, maybe horizontal, but a little less in the vertical. I, this is just based on a survey of the abstracts. I'm sure in some of the discussions we'll hear this, but at least by the sort of titles of the abstracts suggests you know, this, this need for thinking about integration across scales. Institutions, some institutions aren't as represented as others too. Few Global South universities, relatively few U.S. universities from non-coastal states, few universities from island nations, few actual individuals and communities that have retreated. Another gap, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges, women's colleges. So I think it's important that we keep in mind that not all voices are at the table 
in the background of our discussion is what more and more institutions, including the media and universities, are acknowledging as a climate crisis or, or climate concern, as Alex said. As we think about new means of communication, topics like managed retreat um, will be a big part of that, that discussion. Managed retreat cannot be disentangled from conversations about multi-generational commitment to people in the environment, including to those who have not been responsible for a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions to date. And as we think about managed retreat, we need to also think about greenhouse gas emissions that could be associated with those managed retreat decisions. Is it new construction? Is it new decisions about where we're gonna live that embed a lot of carbon emissions? But by the same token, doing managed retreat right may help buy us time for some of these transformational technologies, for example, around carbon capture to get a chance to develop um, as sort of a transformational uh, mitigation. So I wanna thank you for indulging me in these reflections. Um, before we turn it over to our expert panel, I want to also give thanks to Haley and Alex DeSherbinen. It really is inconceivable that the level of interaction and learning we're gonna experience over the next two days could have happened without their efforts. I also wanna thank our sponsors, the Kresge Foundation and NOAA's RESA program. Within Columbia, the Adaptation Initiative, the Sabin Center, uh, and the Tamer Center uh, have also been instrumental to, to making this possible. I also want to acknowledge that today is Juneteenth, uh, celebrated to mark the official end of slavery in the US 154 years ago. I hope that Juneteenth will be in your minds tonight as questions of history and environmental justice permeate every single thing that we talk about. Finally, I'd like to encourage you to tweet about the conference using the conference Twitter handle Managed Retreat CU2019 or simply Managed Retreat. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the panelists to the stage and I'll, I'll quickly do introductions um, as we do so. Please come on up. Okay, so starting from right to left, yeah, okay. Um, Liz Kozlov studies the social, cultural, and political dimensions of urban climate change adaptation. Her current book project, Retreat, Moving to Higher Ground in a Climate Change City, is an ethnographic account of managed retreat. She's an associate professor at UCLA. I'm gonna do very brief um, uh, introductions here. On the website, if you scroll through today, you'll see the longer bios um, for everybody. Uh, then, um, to Liz's next is Elizabeth. I'm probably gonna mangle that Liz Elizabeth um, a little bit tonight. I apologize in advance for that. Elizabeth um, is an internationally recognized Puerto Rican attorney and environmental and climate justice leader of African and indigenous ancestry, born and raised in New York City. She's a national leader in the climate justice movement, co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance, and executive director of, Upro uh, of Uprose, Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. Robin Bronin works as a human rights attorney and has been researching and working with communities forced to relocate because of climate change since 2007. She's worked with the White House Council on Environmental Quality to implement President Obama's Climate Change Task Force recommendation to address climate displacement, as well as the UN High Commissioner for Refugees Climate Change Office. She's a senior research scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and co-founded and works as the executive director of the Alaska Institute for Justice. Finally, Jesse Keenan is a social scientist and a member of the faculty of the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. Keenan's principal research focus is on climate change adaptation and the built environment, including aspects of design, engineering, finance, and planning. Columbia in his past uh, as well. But we, we don't have time to go into that now. So with that, I'm gonna sit and let's get right uh, into our discussions. So, Liz, I'd like to start off um, with a question uh, for you. So, so words matter. We talked a little bit um, uh, about how we define things and who defines matters a lot. Tell us a little bit about how words matter in the context of definitions of managed retreat. Okay, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, everyone who had, had a hand in organizing this and just bringing together so many people whose work has been so foundational and inspirational for me. And I've just learned so much from so many of you in the room. And it's 
like giving me goosebumps to have so many of us here together who have been thinking about this from different perspectives for a long time. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the event. Um, I guess in terms of defining retreat or thinking about the term retreat or managed retreat, which is, um, and I think should be contested, um, you know, in general, when I'm talking to people that don't necessarily think about this topic or that kind of term all the time, just my basic way of thinking about retreat is it's about the relocating of people, unbuilding of land, unbuilding of places, and ideally restoration of habitat in places that are exposed to various effects of climate change. But I think that's a very inadequate, you know, I think it would help maybe for me, personally, I came to studying this um, from urban studies. And I had an immediate suspicion of the term managed retreat because it sounded to me very resonant of sort of racist urban renewal policies like planned shrinkage, like managed decline um, that I had been engaged in studying some of the, the after effects of and these kinds of forced relocation policies. And so for me, I didn't, I kind of took umbrage at the term, the managed part of managed retreat, which you talked about, because I think it assumes this sort of top-down process Whereas I think for me, I prefer to think about retreat as a form of bottom-up grassroots collective action and sort of community organized retreat, maybe community organized state supported retreat. Um, and I wrote an article, The Case for Retreat, a few years ago where I do try to make a case for the term retreat by itself because I think it's a powerful term. I think it's provocative and it has it carries the ambivalence of the process itself, whereas you, you mentioned some of the negative um, connotations of the term retreat, but there's also this positive valence. Retreat is a refuge. Um, other meanings of retreat. And also because I think retreat is powerful insofar as I would like us to think about retreat as not just about retreating from unsustainable places, but from unsustainable ways of life. So ways of life that are premised on sort of endless growth conquest, ideologies of progress and manifest destiny that have created the need for retreat in the first place. And that's part of why I like that term, retreat, um, as I think it signals an opposition to that. So that's sort of my take on this. Thank you. And also, I think some of the local histories of oppression, too, um, is something to, to get away from. Um, Elizabeth, so you know, we're, we're here in New York City. Um, Tell us a little bit, uh, following up on, on your points, Liz, about community level. Tell us what's happening at the neighborhood level um, around resilience more generally, um, and then maybe from there dovetailing into manage retreat more specifically. Sure, and thank you. Buenas tardes, mi gente. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Haley Martinez and, and Radley uh, for inviting me. Um, first, I want to begin with uh, talking a little bit about words because we often talk about um, we talk about climate change as though it started with industrialization, and it really started, particularly because today is June 19th, it really started with the extraction of our people and the extraction of our land. And as descendants of African and indigenous ancestry, uh, we are now trying to reclaim those spaces and honor the traditions of our ancestors so that we can create the kind of society that is going to thrive and survive the changes that are coming. So language is important to us. It's important to the global south. Um, and so what's happening in communities is pretty spectacular. Uh, just today, um, you read in the front page of the New York Times on the right-hand corner how the front line um, and people most impacted by climate change got the most, um, the boldest climate legislation passed in the world. And that is a coalition that we're part of, New York Renews, made up of 180 communities that are urban, they are rural, uh, and they are frontline people that are going to be impacted. We worked for five years to get this legislation passed. Um, so that's huge, and that is frontline people that are doing that. In our community, we just launched the first community-owned solar cooperative in the state of New York. Uh, in Detroit, there is um, streets that are, that are basically lit by solar when the municipality took the funding away from communities. Um, what we call a just transition, which is a move away from the extractive economy to a regenerative economy, is frontline led and the solutions we believe are local. The role that we think that uh, folks that work for universities and for institutes is to support the work that we're doing to amplify it. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that later, what that should look like in the age of climate change. The truth is that conventional approaches to partnerships and decision making have to change. 
And so our communities that are frontline communities, we've got in New York City about 660,000 people living next to within half a mile of significant maritime industrial areas and over close to 500,000 are people of color. And so we have done a lot of that work, the GIS mapping, the data collection, the baseline research. Um, and so those are things that are being done by community. And we invite institutions in to support and to amplify and to finesse a lot of the research. Um, so that's happening. In addition to building leadership, uh, our organizations are intergenerational uh, because we believe that leadership is a continuum and they can't be adult-led or youth-led. Um, and so even our values, our culture of practice defines how we build from the grassroots up. Post-Sandy, post and it was a superstorm, not a hurricane, uh, we created the Climate Justice um, Center in Sunset Park in response to the community's request. Uh, we put out the Climate Justice Agenda with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, and we have been doing an enormous amount of work both on a very local, local level, like looking for uh, the operationalizing of offshore wind, fighting um, the commercialization of industrial sectors that should be used for building for a climate, uh, for climate adaptation and for a climate future instead of being commercialized and being used for high-end uses, um, to looking citywide what legislation looks like on that level and working statewide and nationally. So everywhere, whether we're talking about Indian country, whether we're talking about Detroit, or we're talking about the Gulf South in New Orleans, uh, communities are leading and they're operationalizing this economic uh, vehicle that we call a just transition. Um, and I think that that's something that uh, we would hope that you would look into because I think that if we're gonna survive, relationships have to be different and the front line has to speak for itself. Thank you. Uh, Robin, let's now talk a little bit uh, about the Arctic. You know, clearly um, the Arctic is, is the front lines. We're seeing far more rapid climate change there. We've seen anywhere between 50 and 75% of the volume of late summer Arctic sea ice lost in the last 40 years or so far more than climate models suggested might be possible. Um, and there's real concern that positive feedbacks are underway now that, from, in my opinion, any year could give us an ice-free um, sea ice summer. And I think it's really you know, a big unknown what happens next. It's, you know, it's a brave new world, but one thing we do know is that the vulnerabilities are gonna be huge. You have a much deeper sense um, about the rapid changes in the Arctic, physical systems, impacts, and, and what it's meaning for people. Tell us, tell us about that. Thank you, Radley, and I also want to thank Radley, Haley, and Alex for inviting me to be here um, and to talk about the Arctic, which should be front and center of our conversations these days about the climate crisis. And honestly, I come before you and I am heartbroken because I can barely uh, articulate the level and rapidity of change that I am bearing witness to living in Anchorage, Alaska. I've lived in Alaska for 30 years. And as Radley said, Arctic sea ice is rapidly disappearing. And so, you know, one of the things that I always think about when we talk about the Paris Agreement and what the Paris Agreement said in regard to our temperature thresholds as being at the most two degrees Celsius increase, 1.5 degrees Celsius aspirational, and in the Arctic in the winter time, we are already 3.5 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius increase already. And in March of this year, we were 11 degrees Celsius above the norm. And that is rapidly changing the snow and ice that I rely on to, um, for water and that the indigenous communities that we work with rely on for their hunting and, and gathering of the foods. Um, and it's causing catastrophic land collapse. So um, what you may have read in the paper in the last week is that some permafrost scientists have gone back to areas in the high Arctic and they're seeing thawing permafrost, which is where they were projecting to occur at the end of this century happening now. And so these changes are obviously not staying in the Arctic. It's affecting your weather systems down here in the lower latitudes. And when I think of this term managed retreat, and in Alaska, the communities call it community relocation. It is about the collective right to make decisions about how to adapt to these radical changes in the environment 
and I hold myself responsible. So when I look at what's happening and what's causing these changes, it is my and your greenhouse gas emissions. And if we do not radically cut those greenhouse gas emissions, we are condemning millions of more people to an uncertain future because as Radley mentioned, I've been working on community relocations with the indigenous communities in Alaska now for almost 15 years. The indigenous communities themselves from whom I have learned everything that I'm going to talk about at this conference have been working on it for at least 20 years. And some of you may know of the three communities that have gotten the most press, Shishmaref, Kivalina, and New Talk which have been trying to relocate for, as I said, about 20 years, none has yet relocated. None, because we have none of the governance institutions in place. There's no government agency that has the responsibility. And so the work that we're doing at the Alaska Institute for Justice is we're working with 15 of these communities to create that governance structure. And in closing, I just wanna say how thankful I am that we are talking about historical injustices as part, a critical part of this conversation because we will not be able to relocate in a way that protects people's human rights unless we are talking about decolonizing the systems that have created this problem. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I want to get, get back in a little bit to talking further about urgency in this context. And Jesse, um, get ready, but what we're going to, I'm going to get, get to you in a little bit. I want to circle back though first, Liz. Um, most of your work, or a lot of your work, has focused on urban environments, um, maybe as, as a contrast to what we just heard, or, or maybe similarities. What have been some of your defining experiences and, and takeaways for you um, post-Sandy uh, in New York? And, and then as you've expanded to look at other places, other urban contexts, what's been different and what is sort of the same story everywhere you look? Yeah, so, so I... I came to this topic and to the work I've been doing on retreat, which is based here in New York in Staten Island, um, because I was a PhD student at NYU during Hurricane Sandy and I was living here. And I'd previously done work on kind of anti-displacement activism in the context of urban redevelopment um, outside of New York. And so I'd followed a little bit the debates that arose after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, um, when there was fierce opposition to not rebuilding parts of that city. And when Sandy hit and I was living here, I was interested to see if there would be similar debates here and similar kinds of top-down proposals to not rebuild hard-hit parts of New York that had been recurrently flooded. Um, and if there were, I expected to find similarly fierce resistance to that. And I started going to community meetings in the east shore of Staten Island, um, part of the city where neighborhoods have dealt with recurrent flooding over the years, and also the site of the most deaths in the city during Hurricane Sandy. And at those meetings, um, I found basically the opposite of what I'd expected to find, where I, I showed up and I got to know people and I would go into rooms full of people who had lost their homes during Sandy, been affected by the storm, who were saying, we don't wanna live here anymore. Our neighborhoods shouldn't be here anymore and they were organizing and arguing that their land should be bought out and given permanently back to mother nature, as they said. And, and this to me was you know, really striking as someone who's coming at this from a sociological perspective, much more used to studying how communities fight to come together and preserve the places where they live to understand <laughs> what, it, what it meant for a community to organize to disperse itself in this way how that was happening and also what it meant in a community like this, in a community that's mostly white, blue collar, um, quite politically conservative in one of the wealthiest cities and one of the wealthiest countries in a place where the mayor himself after Sandy was saying retreat was an impossibility. Um, and so that started this kind of long-term process of ethnographic field work and interviews where I spent periods of time living in these neighborhoods and just trying to really understand the social dynamics of this process the lived experience as it unfolded over time for people. Um, so I guess specifically to your question on sort of cities, you know, as a practical matter, urban managed retreat is incredibly vexing for a number of reasons. You have high um, 
land values, powerful development interests, scarce housing, very scarce affordable housing, which tends to be located in flood zones, um, and denser populations. So in these neighborhoods in Staten Island, where I was talking to people, people were literally, in many cases, attached to one another. They lived in attached townhouses, they lived in multifamily buildings, and had to collectively decide what they wanted to do. Um, and I think, you know, overall, a lesson I took from this is retreat, I mean, always is about moving collectives as well as individuals to be effective at reducing risk, not to mention sustaining cultures and social ties. It depends on this kind of collective action. Um, and in Staten Island, kind of key to that were forms of social infrastructure, public spaces to hold community meetings. That's a term from Eric Kleinenberg, who's a sociologist, and there are other things I can get into. But I would just say, you know, even in this place, this is all happening on what's already an incredibly unequal and segregated urban landscape, where the main mechanism we have to do retreat in this country are buyouts. You have to be a homeowner in many of these neighborhoods. To be a homeowner, you had to be white. Um, renters did not have the same voice, and so I was kind of under interested in understanding the complexities of these processes in an urban environment, and I think my kind of take away from all of this reduced down is just that we might expect retreat to be based on physical geography, on factors like elevation and proximity to the coast, but in practice it's based as much if not more on social, political, and economic geography. And so we see retreat represented in the news quite often as inevitable and even desirable for some places, and these are often places that have a history of being positioned as expendable or peripheral. Um, Carol Farbatko calls this wishful sinking. She has a great article about it. And in other places in urban centers like New York City that have long been conceptualized in terms of growth, retreat continues to be framed as an impossibility, as something that's just antithetical to progress, even as you see demands for it actually taking place. Okay, Jesse. Um, it seems that climate change is finally starting to get attention. Um, indeed, your work is central to this. From powerful economic institutions such as investment banks, uh, real estate, insurance, and municipal credit rating agencies. Can you map this out for us just quickly in general terms, uh, this issue of, of sort of risk appreciation under climate change? And then from there, I think we can pivot to talking more specifically about how managed retreat uh, looks in those contexts. So I think the broader, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a great uh, privilege to be here among uh, such uh, distinguished <coughs> panelists who I've drawn inspiration from in different ways, uh, as well as just about half the people in this room. Um, in the world of capitalism and climate change, uh, there's a lot happening, as you can uh, imagine. Part of it is a function of enterprise risk management and understanding things like supply chains, understanding risk premiums and, and the certain mechanisms and machinations of economies uh, that uh, drive us forward uh, in a legacy uh, carbon economy, if you will. There are some, uh, there's a fair amount of bodies of work happening that are driving us towards a uh, carbon neutral economy, of course, and that's important. Then there's the opportunistic end of the equation. So the, there are people out there that are thinking uh, in terms of uh, uh, ESG and governance and triple bottom line who are really trying to think about sustainable portfolios, how they transition institutional uh, finance and investments to help support the transition. There's a, another group of people out there that are driving uh, opportunistic investment. Uh, and, and in fact, that's pretty widespread, right? In the sense that there are already people making money off of volatility created from climate change. If we step back and we think about broader equity markets globally, that is how we all participate one way or the other, either directly or indirectly in global economies. Um, there's less and less volatility. There's more and more uh, standardization associated with essentially computers trading with each other. Climate change creates volatility and hence creates opportunities for exploitation and, and profit seeking in ways that are really difficult to understand. Uh, when we have too much uh, flood waters on, uh, in the uh, Mississippi and we can't move products up, we can't get seeds uh, planted for corn, um, people will die of malnourishment in other parts of the world. And there are people trading in the commodities markets on that. With unequal access to information, presumably too. Exactly. So, so there's a full range of economic activities. I think when we're, my body of work primarily oriented towards the built environment, 
uh, and, and to a lesser extent real estate uh, has really, I think, uh, opened our eyes to what are some emergent pricing signals happening, uh, particularly buying between buyers and sellers of real estate, um, and by extension has implications for uh, renters and other tenure classes. Um, but we're also seeing uh, signals associated with mortgage markets and capital markets. What does that really mean? It means the evaporation of equity. Um, that is, people who've worked hard uh, throughout their lives to make investments in where they live and, and in their communities, uh, much more diverse than I think we probably give recognition to in terms of property owners across the country. Um, and that is, those are significant consequences because many, let's say in intergenerational terms, elderly, for instance, who want to take out reverse mortgages or elderly who simply want to downsize and live in a more sustainable, smaller footprint, um, they are finding it very difficult in many communities to, uh, to get out and to have an exit strategy. Yet at the same time, very large institutional funds um, that own commercial real estate, they're already exiting, right? So there's a full spectrum of activities, and particularly in the real estate and mortgage markets. And right now, it's what I would call a game of chairs. We think we control the music and when the music stops, but as it turns out, we do not. And what I'm concerned with uh, and many things that keep me up at night, but one of the things is who gets left behind. Not only what gets left behind in cultural resources and notions of community capital and social capital, but in the economic refugees, those who are fully displaced, um, who have nowhere to go. Buyout programs sound great. You have to look at who gets accepted, who gets rejected, who participates. But secondary consideration that we have to understand is economic mobility and the slowdown of the great American migration. And it's worth reflecting in this context that American mobility, and this is mobility both in class terms but in spatial location, is a critical part of American history. Now, you could say that, yes, it is part of colonialization, Western expansion, and it has a certain legacy there um, which we can critique and challenge. But in the past 100 years, we've been much more mobile than we are now. It's student loan debt. It's working from home remotely. It's dual incomes. There's a number of different reasons that we have had limited mobility in demographic terms. So when we think about climate migration, we think about managed retreat, we have to think about multiple scales, time horizons, and contextualize it within a broader social science and demography um, that is keeping people trapped, but also perhaps if we think in terms of transformative adaptation, the extent to which there are opportunities for rewriting the rules of economic orders that uh, keep us so bound to where we are and perhaps on uh, outcomes that are less than optimal in social welfare terms. Yeah, I want us to explore that topic further of uh, the sort of framing, uh, optimistic framing, focusing on some of, the, some of the positives in a little bit. But I think you highlighted a lot of critical points, one of them being that e in some communities, even people who may not experience, for example, the rise of the water or, or be right next to the fire zone could suffer if property values fall, if people leave from some of the some businesses, higher assets. Who's left holding the bag? Who has incomplete access to information? Are some people more reliable on some of that public transportation, for example, that may not be as viable vi viable to fund? So there's all these kind of cascading um, impacts to you know to think to think about. Um, okay, uh, question to everybody. Uh, a disproportionate amount of research has focused on places um, that have been impacted by extreme events uh, in recent memory or creeping changes in some cases. Think about New York City and, and Louisiana and how represented they are here. But we know that a dollar invested in advance can give huge returns um, later in terms of prevention, not to mention the potential lives saved. How, though, do we motivate and incentivize research and action in communities proactively that haven't experienced these events? rather than reactively um, in response to a disaster, either at the community scale or at, high, at um, higher scales of government? Question to anybody. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I'm glad that you were talking a little bit about disaster capitalism because I came from Puerto Rico on su Sunday night and, um, and I was in North Carolina the week before. And uh, it's interesting how folks think that disaster capitalism is just corporations descending into our communities and taking advantage of, of disaster. It's 
also NGOs and it's also um, organizations that helicopter into the community and supplant local leadership and come in with the solutions. Uh, folks that come in for land grabs, like what they did in New Orleans, um, is what they're doing in Puerto Rico and really pushing out thousands and thousands of people, close to 400,000 in Puerto Rico, where close to 5,000 people have died. Um, in terms of engaging community, um, it's really important that um, that people not see themselves as the folks that come into community to engage our communities. There are lots of organizations in our communities. Ours has been in Sunset Park since 1966. I'm not the founder. Um, that was funny. Um, and, um, and so it has deep roots and deep trust in the community. And so folks want to engage our communities on climate change without understanding that we are competing with displacement, which is really disrupting social cohesion in our community, um, gentrification, um, ICE. We are competing with police misconduct, poor performing schools, all of the things that affect poor communities and communities of color. Climate justice is, exists at the intersection of racial injustice and climate change. And so engaging community to start planning and thinking and envisioning how to move forward, how extreme heat is going to affect them or living and working in a storm surge zone, um, really requires that we connect their survivability to all of the things that are involved that are affecting their lives. And we tend to work in silos and separate those things. So if you are someone who's undocumented, you're going to be impacted differently by an extreme change, uh, extreme weather event. If you are someone who is a trans woman, you're going to be impacted differently. Um, if you are a young person of color, there may be martial law and there will be excessive policing, particularly in, in communities of color. If you're someone who has health issues because you live in the middle, in the midst of environmental burdens and you've got um, asthma, upper respiratory disease, or any of the things that are related directly to having been born and raised in these communities, you're also impacted. So we really believe that the solutions are local. We created the Climate Justice Center when people came to us and said, we want to do more than change the light bulb, and we want you to engage us and, and, and train us on how to do that. So it became a block-to-block -block organizing effort because we believe, seriously, that every block in New York City is different and the solution is different block by block. You can have a block where you've got a bunch of Section 8 housing and another one where you've got auto salvaging shops. So those auto salvaging shops have to be trained on how to containerize their chemicals and how to protect themselves from, from um, you know, from, um, I, I always miss that, uh, from fugitive dust and from projectiles, that was the word. Um, and so with people who live in buildings, they can paint their rooftop, rooftops white. They can build an anaerobic digester together. There's all kinds of affordable and accessible things that people can do to address climate change. And that one person on the block who is the busybody I always talk about knows who's on a respirator, who's on dialysis. That is your block captain. That is your organizer on the block. That is the person who knows when the first responders show up who is particularly vulnerable and what kind of medical care that person needs to get. So the knowledge is really local. People are brilliant. When you think about a community like Sunset Park, for example, what do we have there? We've got people from the Caribbean. We've got people from Mexico, people from China, people from the Middle East. And they know how to do things, make things. They have traditions that are going to take us to a place where we will be safe. So it's not this idea where you take this cookie cutter approach and impose it on people when it doesn't belong. It's really being in community and understanding the cultural strength, celebrating difference, and using that difference as a way of building what everyone in this room calls resilience and we call resistance. We don't yeah. use the word resilient because resilient means bouncing back. And for communities of color, we don't want to go back to poverty. We don't want to go back to police abuse. We don't want to go back to any of the isms that we grew up in the middle of. Yeah. So we have to move forward. Anyway, I'm sorry I talked so long. No, good, that's so, great. Okay. Um, could I yeah. answer that too, please? Yeah, please. Yeah, so the, um, you know, for, for us um, in Alaska, the way that we think about the answer to that question is about who's making the decision about whether and when relocation needs to occur. 
And you can never start the conversation by thinking that re you can talk about relocation, even in a place like Alaska, where the environmental changes are profound and are literally causing communities to sink below sea level. So we created community-based monitoring programs. We asked communities what environmental changes they wanted to monitor. And we worked then with state and federal government agencies to implement these community-based monitoring programs. So we've um, begun community-based erosion monitoring with state and federal government agencies because that also creates this multi-level governance structure that needs to be in place to facilitate a relocation. You are not going to be able to, one, decolonize these systems that have caused communities to be vulnerable starting the conversation with relocation. And so by starting it by what is happening in your environment and what are the things that can be done to protect you in place and is protection in place possible, we are beginning that conversation. And the other critical piece that we are working on with NOAA is the documenting of storms. So in Alaska, um, some of you may not know that most of our state has no roads. And there are 229 indigenous tribes, and most of those tribes are only accessible by 10-seater planes. And so when storms occur, and we don't get hurricanes in Alaska, but we do get hurricane strength winds. And without that Arctic sea ice, those storms are radically inundating communities, and there are, so there are no evacuation routes. And so documenting how the storms are occurring, how much flooding is happening, and then what the impacts are is absolutely critical to not only document that for the communities, but also then sharing it with state and federal government agencies that may not know what is happening in such remote parts of our state. And it's through that process that we were able to identify a new hazard in our state um, called Ushtek, which is a Yupik word, and it means catastrophic land collapse. And it's caused by the combination of erosion, permafrost thawing, and storm surges. And that was just included in our state's hazard mitigation plan, which is critical because in order for communities to get access to resources when Ushtek occurs. Yeah. So classic examples of co-generation of, of knowledge and the, the need for these kind of partnerships that, that are so key, and also positive themes emerging from these, these last remarks. Um, Jesse, maybe take us a little further and others too around, I mean, clearly there's inevitably negativity, fear when we're thinking about stranded assets, uh, moral hazard, um, some of these some of these investments. But as you've, as you've indicated, um, there are also positive framings, getting people out of harm's way, better investments, even something seemingly more superficial but critically impor important, economic opportunities in new places, either other parts of communities or maybe moving back to Rust Belt cities, just to give one example. Take us somewhere in terms of your thinking about positive framings um, and why they're so important yeah, around just, managed retreat. Yeah, I, yeah I, I completely agree, and I'll start with where um, Elizabeth quite eloquently left off with resilience. I've been preaching analytical and conceptual discipline associated with the various categorical elements of resilience. I've got some MIT students here who will know this too well. Uh, uh, and when we look at you know community resilience versus engineering resilience um, uh, and various uh, derivatives thereof, there is this elasticity to the operations of status quo. And you know, without fundamentally challenging those institutions that define our vulnerability in the first place, um, we're setting up um, uh, the perpetuation of certain power regimes that are really working uh, against a broader notion of transformative adaptation. And transformative adaptation will no doubt have winners and losers. Um, the idea for thus, and I, what I think is incumbent upon society, is to think about who are those losers and the extent to which we can mitigate those impacts those effects and the like. Some of the work that we've done, and some of you might have seen the work uh, as it was profiled in the New York Times in a video in Duluth, Minnesota, where we thought, uh, um, uh, what are the right, we, we started out thinking about what were the range of cities in the future uh, in the United States where people may want to move to, in, at least in terms of elective mobility. 
Uh, and um, what were the capacities? What was their climate like? What, what are the various qualities, attributes from which we can make a qualitative argument that, uh, that these may be uh, uh, places people may want to move to? Duluth, Minnesota came up. And what we did is we worked through a, uh, a we created a workflow uh, moving from demography into infrastructure capacity analysis, into fiscal impact analysis, and all the way into branding and advertising to think about what are the optics? How do we engage with people? How do we engage with the, cult the culture and the society and the communities that are in situ, that are part of Duluth, um, uh, and the indigenous communities in particular? Um, but uh, what does it mean when we set up the conflict of people moving, particularly from the southeast, and maybe they're bringing their more conservative values, uh, their fundamentalism and their guns to a much more open society in the upper Midwest. What does that really mean? What are the implications of that? Of course, we could only f understand this deterministically in terms of economy and space and things that I have some peripheral understanding of. But it was important to get the conversation going. And I think what we highlighted was that there was an opportunity to think about the redistribution of people and economy and the opportunity to tax, uh, particularly those who have some uh, function for elective mobility, and to redistribute that to offset the costs uh, of this redistribution of, of people, which, of course, in the yeah. course of human settlement and civilization has happened many, many times. So it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity, I think, for us to think about economic development and how can we think about uh, economic development, competitive economic development, where people are actually in investment in human capital is critically important. You don't buy into what you hear about artificial intelligence and all that jazz. It will no doubt have massive implications in the labor market, but at the end of the day, it's about people and investments in human capital. And I think climate change and, and the associated migration patterns that will stem from that, we can understand that as retreat. I really like retreat versus managed retreat. Um, will no doubt uh, derive some real opportunities for people in terms of economic mobility. Uh, the question is what do we leave behind and how do we gauge with what is left behind? And how do we help some of these um, sustaining uh, communities or receiving communities? What do they need? Uh, Liz, to you quickly. Yeah, just quickly because you bring up framing, and one of the things that struck me most as I was doing this research in Staten Island was how radically different the kind of framing of retreat in most media accounts I read and in sort of public and political discourse was from what I was hearing from people who were actually engaged in the very fraught process of leaving their homes um, and the very different way that they framed it and talked about it. And so just as a kind of quick example, Radley, you used the term abandonment. And that was something that Mayor Bloomberg said when he said, you know, as New Yorkers after Sandy, we cannot and will not abandon our waterfront. And he said, we will protect it, not retreat from it. Um, and so retreat was just often framed as sort of a moral failure, an abandonment of identity, community, and so on, a sort of disinvestment. And among the people I was talking to in Staten Island um, who were organizing and fighting for this and, and going through it themselves, they spoke of retreat very, very differently as a kind of moral achievement, a sort of sacrifice for the greater good. They spoke about how they were giving their homes back to Mother Nature as a way to protect their communities and make their neighbors inland safer. And they felt that that was a very profound and meaningful act and that collectively deciding to do that was an incredibly, for those that succeeded, empowering process. Mm. Um, and that was something I heard again and again from people as I was doing my research about this idea that actually they forged many connections to each other and connections to the place where they were from through the act of organizing to give it back in a way to nature as a public space um, and so on. And I just think that's so important to, to hold in mind. Thank you, Liz. I, I just, so, I, I just want to say something sure. about that. I, I just think that the ability to be able to make that choice is something that the privileged can do. And it's really important that we make a distinction between people who have no choice and people who have the option to turn it over to nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. And without, without agency, uh, yeah. So I'd love to keep going with this discussion, but I sense a lot of audience questions. So one thing I want to say is we're going to go till 8.10, not 8, so we'll have time for more discussion. Um, and without, without further ado, let's turn it over. We're setting up mics um, in each aisle. Let's take questions um, for the panelists. And uh, please, no pontification. Let's get you know right to questions and, and discussion. <laughs> 
What can anyone pontificate about on this subject? <laughs> Uh, Radley, while we're waiting for questions, I just want to highlight one thing. Uh, we released a report at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco on Monday um, that highlights the capacity for banks to get Community Reinvestment Act credit uh, associated with uh, hazard mitigation, resilience, and adaptation initiatives. I encourage you to check it out. There's a great article in the Wall Street Journal on it on Monday. And you will see in there, in the ta uh, figure one, uh, a, uh, a an orientation to analyzing uh, managed retreat from the banking community's point of view and from a community development point of view. And I think it's, it's critically important in what this figure does, and I don't want to speak too much to it because I want to get to questions, but it's just about trade-offs, right? So there's nothing, there's no absolutism to the outcomes of any of this. And I think what we need to be clear is or what and where those trade-offs are and what are the distributional costs and benefits of who bear it bears those burdens uh, and who bears those benefits. Towards that last point, how does everybody get a seat at the, at the table in, in those societal discussions? Okay, let's go here. Hi, Carrie Hewlett. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I wonder if you could speak to, maybe all four of you actually could speak and say something different about this, but it's one thing to move from one neighborhood to another, from one state to another, from one country to another. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that, particularly Robin, I'm thinking about. Um, it's one thing to just leave a neighborhood and then go reestablish a life in a different neighborhood that's fairly similar. But when you move from a place that your, that your ancestors have lived in your entire life and economy and way of life is built around a specific location, um, that's just such a different kind of move. So I wonder if you all could speak to that a little bit. Where, what, what's the, what are some of the sort of obvious and not so obvious differences. Thanks. Robin, and then maybe quick comments from others. Yes, well, and the word that I keep coming back to is grief, because there's an enormous amount of grief about leaving these places. And, um, and so the communities that we work with rely on the ocean and the land to, for their food and cultural sources. And last week, 18 dead seals washed up on one of the beaches. Um, so the ocean is radically changing. And in regard to where communities are thinking of going, it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, but all of them want to stay in their traditional grounds where they hunt and fish. And I think the the big question is because permafrost, so you know, for those of you who don't know Alaska, um, the northern part of our state is frozen ground. And um, it is the frozen ground on which infrastructure can be built. And as I previously mentioned, that is thawing rapidly. And so the traditional engineering tools that have been used to keep infrastructure intact is no longer working. And I think that that is going to be the bigger and much more difficult question to answer in regard to where communities are going to be able to go. Um, the other thing that I would add is I think um, because it has been so difficult for these communities to get the resources they need to implement what they have determined as their best long-term adaptation strategy, there's a thought from state and federal government agencies because they're in danger. They are in danger and, they, and that they will just disperse and go to larger communities and that is not happening because the land on which they live is sacred to them. And so figuring out where to go is a really difficult process that we are engaging them with to try to do that planning because to build infrastructure into the future takes many, many years, and we're really concerned about how much time communities have to actually be where they are, given the, given the rapidity of changes that are occurring. The flip side of that is, and we've looked at this in from perhaps a slightly more, uh, less rigorous social science point of view, as a place like Miami, where you have very low civ civic participation rates and people do not consider the land sacred. And in fact, they've done everything to suggest otherwise. <laughs> and we think that uh, there are thresholds and tipping points in terms of uh, behavior and economic behavior that would that highlight uh, that devaluation and their extent to which they uh, are likely to be more mobile in their uh, displacement. Other quick comments? I was just going to say there are uh, indigenous people in Florida, 
um, and there are in the in the Miami Climate Justice Alliance. There's a number of groups that are organizing, uh, organized when we were organizing the People's Climate March, the more recent one, um, and the one that we did in 2014, and uh, and we're seeing a rise in uh, civic participation, maybe led by the 25 people in my family who live in Miami. I don't know. I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping. Uh, but there is a there is no, I, no, there's I, I, seriously I, a growing concern in particular because there's so many Caribbean people uh, living in Miami and they see the correlation between uh, seeing the water come up when there isn't even uh, rain in Miami and what is happening um, in, in in the Caribbean. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> totally hear you, and, and, there, and that's going to be the case everywhere in many ways. What I think what I was speaking to is the disproportionate impact. Um, that uh, non-resident buyers and, and, and yeah. uh, have had and the influence yeah. that they've had in driving policy and markets. And, and those non-resident investors, really, they're not residents, they're just investors. Um, uh, that, that has influence for people who, um, who have roots and legacies in Miami. And that's what I'm concerned about and, and, and I want to learn more about. No, I agree. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I mean, no, on these kind of multiple Miamis, on Alaska, New York, you know, I think one thing that for me, um, I want to come back to this point you were making too about privilege um, in relation to these forms of movement. And one thing I've seen, um, you know, in Staten Island and in the work I'm doing there is how forms of power and privilege can be and are being mobilized um, to reap resources to retreat and adapt that are unavailable and often unavailable by design. Um, to the very people in communities that are disproportionately affected, not just by disasters and climate change, but by environments that have been deadly on a daily basis for a very long time. Um, and I think it's so critical to think about the production of environmental privilege and precarity in relation to one another, because there are vast resources that are being and have been spent on enabling wealthier, whiter communities to remain in places that are incredibly dangerous but incredibly desirable. Um, Mike Davis has written about this in terms of Malibu, um, Tim Collins in terms of floods, um, and we see this on waterfronts all the time. And I think just thinking about privilege and power and injustice across scales from the very local but also to the global, the rural and the urban is really key to hold in mind when we talk about retreat. It's not just about one site. Thank you. I'm going to go now to Mike. We're starting to get a lot of questions. Let's try to target one person on the panel for your question. <laughs> okay, um, I'll do my best. Uh, Michael Berger, I'm at the Sabin Center here at Columbia Law School. Um, I think retreat is often thought of in terms of affirmative interventions, um, in terms of, um, you know, well, managed retreat in terms of affirmative interventions. Uh, but there's another side of it, which is about the removal of incentives that artificially incentivize risk um, and put people in harm's way. And so my question is very direct, and I'm not sure. I think it touches, Liz, on points that you were, you were just raising. But I'm interested to hear about how you conceptualize um, issues around removal of incentives to be in harm's way, what you're seeing on the ground when these, those incentives are removed, and then how you analyze and assess markets and other factors that are playing into those sorts of uh, scenarios. I mean, I think what you're getting at, I, I agree, and I think structurally one of the major challenges we have, for instance, with the National Flood Insurance Program, with the way SBA and post-disaster FEMA set up, is that it heavily, heavily biases property owners, uh, and, uh, and that has gross implications for resource allocation in a post-disaster context. Um, and, it, and I, you know, but it also sets up, um, a lot of distortions in, in, in markets and probably under uh, captures risk um, that makes places indirectly affordable in the short term but wholly unaffordable in the long term. And I think that's what makes me most worried and concerned about is that there are people who are um, buying uh, or renting or living in a community and they're not fully uh, understanding that the investments that they make in blood, sweat, and tears or financial investments are being challenged because they've been so grossly underappreciated okay. as a risk function. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Let's go over here. Hi, my name is Shanaja Selman. It's nice to see you again, Liz and Jesse. Um, my question goes particularly to Elizabeth, but I think, Liz, you can also weigh in on this, is I think uh, there's beauty in thinking about grassroots kind of um, community-led agree, you know, agreeing on retreating as being 
part of uh, the adaptation process for a group of people, but I think we know that the buyout process results in you know a piecemeal where you have people left over and holdouts and. Mm -hmm. And I guess what, I wanted to hear your thoughts on kind of how do you get to that individual level? Because at the end of the day, retreating is an indiv it's a household decision, right? You're going to do what's best for you or your family. Um, and so how do we start to even get down to that granular level and really kind of push the, the, the conversation retreat so that it's actually collectively done? Um, I think I heard manage retreat for the first time when I was invited to this conference. I don't know that um, that language is part of the way that we're talking about uh, community. In our community, we've doubled the amount of open space. We've stopped the siting of a power plant. We've expanded a median. We have planted thousands of trees. We have tried to do everything to reduce coal pollutants and to address climate change. We think of the industrial sector as a place that will retain jobs, retain communities and small businesses, and take us out of harm's way. Um, and we have talked about building upland. For example, uh, folks have wanted, because there were so many children, to put the children on the industrial sector, and we talk about all the chemicals that are contained there, and the Department of Education has said, well, we, you know, we can clean up a brownfield, and we're like, but you can't control adjacent lots, and those emissions and that dust will end in the lungs of our children. So we have those conversations, and the community really is an integral part of that. In terms of moving, <coughs> Um, I think that uh, we, we are in the highest elevation point in Brooklyn, in Sunset Park. Um, and so people um, don't have that. They live uh, doubled and tripled up. Uh, they have two and three jobs. And I don't think that's an option. So when we think about climate adaptation, we look at lo where we are locally and what you can do in place. Uh, but in terms of moving, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, um, I don't think that having been, I live in that neighborhood, my family has been in that neighborhood since 1980, um, and I don't think that that is an option. I know that neighborhood really well. Um, so, um, and, and it's different from place to place. What the options and what the solutions are could be as different, it's different in Park Slope than it is in Sunset Park. And it's different in Sunset Park than it is in Borough Park. So even neighborhoods have completely different solutions. And you have to listen to where people are on the ground and listen carefully with all of your senses to really help develop solutions that are coming from the ground. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, I would just say, I mean, I'd first be interested to hear your take on this, because I know you've done a lot of research in Texas, and I'm looking forward to your panel. Um, but one of the things that was really frustrating for me was just seeing the extent to which people who had organized very effectively together and at one point in time seemed nearly unanimously unified around the idea of moving, like albeit to different places. This was, you know, as I said, kind of an organizing to disperse, were really broken up and fractured through the buyout process. Um, in part, you know, in the first part, because only a fraction of them were eventually deemed eligible for the state's buyout program, um, which broke up neighborhoods and communities in a particular way. Also because different criteria for eligibility or the ability to participate, whether you were in flood zone A, flood zone V, um, whether you had an underwater mortgage, um, whether you were non-compliant with your flood insurance, with FEMA, all these things were things that kind of broke up people that initially had been trying to kind of push in the same direction. Um, and then just the time spent waiting and all the things that happened where people went into foreclosure, people lost the ability and the choice that they maybe once felt they had at the beginning over the many years they were sometimes waiting to get the support. So I think that's a great question. Thanks. Thank you. So we have five minutes um, until we start the reception. Here's what I propose we do. There's five people standing up. State your question concisely, please, and then we'll try to parse out who answers. Let's go here. Sure, David Kay from Cornell's Community and Regional Development Institute. My question, we work mostly at the community level. My question though is probably for starting with Robin because she's talked most explicitly about multi-level institution building is thinking about the institutional capacity needed at different levels to be able to respond to the scale of changes that climate change recommends. So the scale of change is really what I'm really trying to address in institutions. I'll make sure we get, get to that one. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Ros Donald. I'm a climate communications PhD student here at Columbia, and I study Miami. Um, I'm really interested in the um, discourse right now in the environmental community that stigmatizes refugee status. So they say, like, 
Trump doesn't care about climate change, you wait till these refugees turn up uh, on your on your doorstep. And so I guess my question is to Robin, which is, you know, what what can we as scholars do to educate the environmental community that this is a really um, troubling and, and uh, problematic way about talking about climate change? Uh, John Lopez, uh, Katrina survivor, but uh, my question is about, I, I, all the panelists emphasize the importance of community, and so I'm not taking anything away from that, but I'm just wondering, uh, there's a need, it seems, a complementary uh, governmental involvement, and I'm just wondering, I'm hearing more of a mixed message, is that more at a federal level, state level, county level, municipality? Um, thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, Judge Heckman, NYU Tandon uh, School of Engineering, but I'm an urban planner. Um, in the work that I did on my dissertation a number of years ago, studying 40 communities from Maine to Virginia for a NOAA grant on coastal, uh, coastal resilience, um, one thing that we discovered was that retreat is not an all or nothing proposition. And it's very nuanced, and we found uh, communities that were retreating in all kinds of different ways. For instance, towns on e in the east end of Long Island that had 150 foot setbacks uh, for, from the dune line for septic tanks. It may not seem like much, but if you're closer than that and there's a storm, you can't build back at that proximity. Um, communities that actually banned certain types of hazardous industrial uses in their floodplains, gas stations, for instance, or floatable uh, tanks for fuel. Uh, and so retreat can be partial. So I just want to know if you have examples of that and just encourage everyone to be thinking about ways that that can happen throughout the conference. Thanks. Okay. Quickly, last question. Hello, my name is Caetano with ACEEE and CCL. I want to ask you if you have any knowledge about how to deal, how to prepare cities both uh, culturally and economically and politically uh, to receive the retreat because the infrastructure for uh, feeding, uh, supplying energy, water, clean water, everything to the people moving to the other cities is critical to be prepared much e a, lot of, a lot of years before. Okay. So I propose, mate, let's go to you, Robin. Let's hear a little bit um, about the question of institutional capacity and scale, that first question here, but then also maybe continue on about uh, some of the topics related to communication and the framing of refugees, and then we'll take it from there. Yes, so I want to acknowledge the scale is uh, daunting. And the way that we approach it in developing these multi-level governance structures is we work on particular issues. So we are decolonizing these systems that have caused communities to be vulnerable. And one of the ways that we do that is by submitting comments when comments open for different state or federal government agencies that may have anything to do with this topic. So within our state, it was about housing and we submitted comments about including environmentally threatened communities as, as homeless, um, as, as warranting homeless status. And we got that accepted into our state um, plan in regard to housing. And it's these small steps that will lead to these bigger changes, but it's critical because for all the comments that we do, we involve the tribes. So we're working with tribal, state, and federal government agencies and trying to create, create this collaboration and coordination with the tribal governments, leading whatever efforts and policy level changes that we are recommending to these different state and federal government agencies that have any impact on this issue of relocation. In regard to refugee, the, the term refugee, so I do not like to use that term in this context at all as an immigration attorney in my past. Um, and one of the reasons is if you think of the term refugee, that, co that term was created because communities, people, could not rely on their countries of origin to provide the protection that they needed, and their governments may have been the ones persecuting them. So when we use, in my mind, when we use that term refugee in this context, we're abdicating responsibility to, to, to our federal government agencies that should, we should be looking to for the technical assistance support that communities will need to implement whatever they see as their long-term adaptation strategy. Okay, let's now, in the very short remaining time, anyone want to take on this issue of sort of the, the nuance and gradients of, of retreat, that it's not always a full abandonment, some of the issues of where 
particular um, uh, house assets might be cited as critically important. Maybe people mostly leave, but still come back to a site. Some of those types of topics, maybe wants to weigh in on that gradient. And then also um, about this issue of tools, needs of receiving places. I guess just two final points from me. The first on that um, is I confronted a number of times just an assumption that people, an assumption from people in government that those who were fighting for retreat here in New York and Staten Island would just wanted money to get out, to get somewhere safer, and wouldn't care about what happened to the land after they left. Um, and that was manifestly not the case. Um, as some of you might know, there were multiple programs open to people who wanted to relocate eventually. There was the city's Build It Back program, which offered an acquisition for redevelopment, which meant that when you left, your land would be auctioned uh, to the highest bidder that promised to rebuild in a more flood-resilient manner. A number of people I talked to even though that would give them roughly the same amount of money, said, well, I don't want to leave if a wealthy person's going to live here instead. You know, I want to leave if no one profits from this except nature. And, and we're very adamant about that fact. And I think there's a big question about what happens to land after retreat. There's a big question about what happens to people, where do they go, what happens in places where they wind up, what happens to people that, you know, are staying in place. But I think this question about what happens to land and what... Um, what voice people whose land that was, not just most recently, but historically, have um, in those conversations. And that's something I just feel like is not talked about really at all or enough. Um, and then just kind of a final um, point on this in terms of you know many of the things that have come up, I just think it's really crucial um, to just listen and learn from what's already happening in places, and particularly in terms of this question of scale, which happens a lot in organizing. Um, you know, I think it's movements, long-standing movements for housing justice, racial justice, economic justice, um, and environmental justice that should really be central to this conversation about retreat, um, because I think there's just no way that just an equitable retreat could proceed without that being at the forefront and leaders like yourself and your organization. Add something. Just, just a few things. Um, Puerto Ricans didn't want to call themselves climate refugees. And Puerto Rico is the oldest con colony in the world. And part of the devastation was also contributed by the fact that they had a long history of austerity and neglect. And they couldn't depend on the United States to save them. Uh, because this was a federal administration that saw us as outsiders and didn't want to support us and was very clear about that. So. The solutions had to be local, and we had to move money, and we had to move brigades to help people on the ground so that they could be, be able to, to fend for themselves, to support the work that was happening on the ground. So that's really important. In terms of stigmatizing, um, it isn't just that refugees is, is something that's stigmatized. It's also homelessness. Like even here in New York City, homelessness is an issue. I live on 44th Street in Sunset Park, don't visit me. Uh, and there was a building that just burned down and 100 people became homeless. But in the next neighborhood, in, um, in um, Park Slope, they don't want homeless shelters in their community because homeless people are considered criminals, dirty, because we're talking about people of color. And we have to center race on these conversations. And if you don't talk about race and you think you could talk about climate change without talking about race and centering the front line and just transitions, then we are not having a conversation. We also, if you're really, really interested in being part of the solution, have to stop talking up here and talking in language that is accessible. It feels sometimes like everybody's trying out for tenure. Yeah, you know, we're really smart people and we're the folks on the ground that's making it happen, that's changing legislation, that's changing the landscape, and you play a very important role in supporting, providing data, providing research that supports the work that we're doing on the ground and we wanna partner with you. But in order to do that, you have to engage in what we call just relationships. We are not in a place right now where we can be competitive with each other. We have to work in collaboration. Climate change is going to disrupt everything, including governance. So even government, and there are people here from the mayor's office, think of communities as people that have to be managed. We have to manage the expectations of people on the ground. The truth is that a real meaningful partnership would mean that you are thinking of people in the community as the brain trust of the community and identifying what are the strengths and what are the gaps and how we work with each other in a very different way. 
to basically approach it in the way that universities and governance has been doing is not to accept the fact that climate change is here and that we need to start now building the kinds of relationships that are gonna help us survive and transform how our communities are impacted or not by climate change. And then finally, I wanna talk about scale and replicability. I had the opportunity just recently to review an application from Alaska for funding and people who were reviewing that application said, but it can't be scaled. How does it work here? And I said, you cannot compare an application for funding in Alaska to the lower 48. And you need to stop talking about scale when you're talking about grassroots folks, because that is a way of putting the funding in top heavy organizations that already have a lot of it. What you should be talking about is replicability. And so using standards that diminish, diminish our ability to transform is also a form of racism. It's a form of keeping us in place and basically making it possible for institutions that really get a lot of funding but do very little, what grassroots organizations are doing all over the United States is huge compared to the size of their staff and the size of the budgets and all the research has shown that we basically deliver at a level that big organizations don't. So what I would ask you to do, and I'm sorry for talking so long, but you're, you're a captive audience right now. What I would ask you to do is to read the Hermes Principles for Democratic Organizing, to look at the Climate Justice Alliance and look at what a just transition is, to go to movement generation and look at what that frame work is, how we move away from a regenerative economy, I mean from an extractive economy to a re regenerative one, and then I would like you to talk about public banks and, and the new economy project, because this is no longer time to have relationships that are conventional. We really need to change everything, everything. That's why when that bill hit the New York Times today, we said basically we had to think as big and move as big as the climate crisis. So I'm sorry. With that, no, I think with that, it's time to move to reception. We're gonna we're gonna open up some seats here and continue some of these discussions. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to go so deeper sorry. here, but I really enjoyed the, the conversation that we had, and look forward to continuing tomorrow. We're gonna be in the law school, the Saban Center, starting at 8:30. Excuse me. Let's take a moment. Let's thank again the panelists. Thank you.